Welcome to the Gabe Gallucci Golf Show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gabe Gallucci Golf Show. Today, I'm super pumped. I get to bring you the two-time Canadian long drive champ, one of the first three people in the world to hit 230 mile per hour ball speed. Currently, 10th in the world in long drive. My boy, Ryan Gregno. What up, sir? <sighs> Thanks for having me, man. This is, uh, you know, a pretty cool full circle moment for us in, you know, where we kind of met and where things have gone in both directions. And yeah, now you got your own podcast running. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it was yeah. wild. I, I I remember when I was doing my full golf cocaine mode in 2020, playing <laughs> my 36 holes a day and just yeah. absolutely trying to shoot under par. Um, <laughs> got to meet you at Gold Country Club, which is a really cool course out in St. Catharines. Stanley Thompson design, absolutely unreal. And uh, I remember seeing you in that warm up area, just crushing balls. And I was like, oh, cool. This guy's like, this guy hits it a mile. And then we ended up playing in the same group. And I was like, oh, this is great. I get to, you know, it's the first time I'd seen somebody, you know, do the, the vertical jump in a, in a swing. Right. And I was like, man, that, that's different. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that summer was, it was tough, right? Like for, for all of us, obviously, I believe it was like the 2020 summer I had come off you know, a, a great finish to my my first real good finish in the World Long Drive Tour. And I was super excited. And I'm like, hey, we're going to take this on. We're going to get this rolling. We're going to take it seriously for the first time in our life. And, you know, we got up to, I think it was like 220 ball speed at the time, which was a big number back then. Uh, oddly enough, it wasn't that long ago. But, um, you know, it was prepping to the 2020 season and, you know, flights were booked to the first event. And, you know, we kind of got something came along and shut down the whole world. And I mean, it likely intrigued you to play more golf, but at the same time, it left me with nothing to do but really play golf. <laughs> right. Right. So it was, it was one of those, yeah, it was, it was fun. Like it was a fun summer. I kind of felt like I was a little left in the behind things, not being able to leave the country and, you know, the world long drive tour kind of folding and us starting from scratch and all that. Um, but yeah, like we were both chasing our kind of own, own thing yeah, at chasing. the time, right? Chasing dream and, and and four years later we're still crazy enough to keep doing it. <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say, I, I noticed though, you know, from when we played. So you started in long drive in two thousand eight. Yeah. And and you kind of saying that you know it was that twenty nineteen season that then kind of turned a light switch on for you and and there was been drastic growth since. Yeah. And and I and you you know you could see it. I even remember playing with you. Like you're you're a specimen as is. You're six four two twenty five. <laughs> and so, you know, you're, you're already a unit, but it also, you know, from playing with you to seeing your evolution the past four years, there's been a, a significant difference in just your physicality watching that progression. What was the light switch that turned on for you? You know, having been in the sport for 11 years up to 2019, yeah. what was that light switch? And then how did you kind of keep making these compounding gains the past couple of years? You know what? I think the biggest factor, and, and this is completely not related to the sport whatsoever, but during that period of 2008 to 19, I had taken years away. Um, financial, where I was living at the time. I mean, I was living up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And oh, wow. There, yeah, that's there, a, bit, yeah, that's a there, bit of a hike. It's kind of where I grew up, right? And I kind of. I ran out of access to specific things, whether it be the ability to travel costs. I picked up, you know, personal training as a full-time job. So anytime away, I was essentially losing money. Uh, online wasn't really a huge thing back then. So you couldn't just kind of travel as you went. Right. Um, but during that endeavor, I discovered I really enjoyed lifting heavy things and I needed to keep my competitive nature kind of flowing into my 30s at the time. Um, and so I took up powerlifting and, you know, you and I are similar when we kind of head into something. It's, we don't go yeah. in at like 40, 50, <laughs> we go in at like, okay, we're going to do this at a hundred percent. And, um, you know, I took it on and it really showed me discipline. That was, that was the biggest part of, Interesting. you know, I, during all, during all this, I moved to Southern Ontario, met my now fiance and, you know, she was into powerlifting. So we had that in common at the time. And, you know, just the, the rigorous training that I was putting myself through, whether it be the workouts during the week, the amount of sleep, the amount of food, um, just all of that, all of the things that kind of came together 
that forced me to be very regimented in everything I was doing, um, which cool. I found once I stepped away from that, um, which basically I hurt myself at a competition right. and I, you know, I'm six, four, two twenty five. I ain't built to be a power lifter. I, you just, I, I needed to be around 300 pounds and there's, there was no possible way. Um, and for health reasons, it just would have been astronomically right. dumb. Yeah. Um, so I then found a long drive competition on the world long drive qualifier an hour from where we now live. And I was like, Oh, huh, let's just go see everybody. Like, we'll we'll go in it, but let's just more just go hang yeah, out. Touch and, base and yeah, you know, hang out with old friends. And so I showed up with some borrowed clubs. I hit a ball 408 yards and the bug, <laughs> the, the bug literally was like, and again, like I posted that swing a few times back a year or two ago. And it's it's literally like arm parallel at best and just grunting it from just there. brute force and I, I can say by the afternoon because you go through a qualifying process in the morning you get through to go to the afternoon and then the afternoon you go through a five round round and i was not conditioned for this at all like i was like power lifting just came off of like okay i need to do three reps today and i'm right. good to the conditioning of having a swing and golf club upwards of 150 times in a single day all out two completely different conditioning mechanisms um so that was that was kind of where it all got kind of began and then i carried it forward from there into uh, getting my first TPI screening uh, by a suggestion of Jason Zubak. He's like, Dude, yep. you can't move. You need to be able right. to move. And so like I did with powerlifting, I just started subjectively studying myself more and more and more. Um, you know, in powerlifting, I squatted 620 pounds for a guy that weighed 240 and yeah. was long, skinny legs. Like, I don't got big legs. It's a running joke. We all get it. Ha ha. Good enough. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I was able to produce certain specific things because of my movement pattern and studying the mechanics and the way the body needs to move and how myself specifically needs to move. Right. And so it just turned into this continual learning, continual kind of strive for, you know, what's the next piece? What's the lo next lowest hanging fruit? What? And it just, it doesn't stop. Like I'm, I'm yeah. nonstop with it now all the time. Well, that, and that's been the coolest thing I think to watch is that there's been, you know, like significant improvement year over year, you know, having, having kind of seen when you even weren't really posting when I first met you and then you slowly started even just kind of documenting the journey and you're going yeah. to the simulator and, and kind of showing that it's been really cool. Cause you can see that there has been gains year over year, even despite uh, you having that injury. And I remember I was watching that live and I went, <laughs> Oh man, cause you were, and cause you were sweet. Like that was, you were doing well that season too. Like it was like, yeah, you know, it was the manifestation of a lot of that work. And so that, you know, that was brutal to see, but what's incredible is that you've been able to then parlay that still you had you still had a great following season like you it's almost like it didn't it didn't hinder that right. growth and that's that's a testament to that commitment that learning and then you make a great point too of uh, and I think this is where long drivers you guys have a, uh, maybe a better insight than people that are just kind of playing normal golf you know um, you guys take so much inputs on how your body actually works because you understand that is the true engine of the swing yeah and i and i i took that you know once i started getting into ground forces yeah. i started to realize how much we do as and and that fitness is a big priority for me yeah i'm amazed at the what the body is as the engine of the swing and i feel like long drive you guys are way ahead of the general golfing population in terms of the knowing the value of tpi screens and then taking that information and parlaying it into gains for yourself that are measurable and, and actually translate. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, I'm at the, I'm at the point now where, you know, there's never going to be a five, 10% gain in a very short amount of time. Right. Like right. when I'm at my peak, I'm looking for 1%, 0.5%, something in the realm of, okay, can we get one mile per hour faster? Or can we get, you know, one, you know, one more swing in the path that we want to actually create. Can we create the pressures on a more consistent basis that create the best output? Um, and I mean, you're very informed on, you know, swing catalyst pressures and things like that. Working with your coach, I believe Ryan, 
Holly. Ryan Holly, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's where I don't just look at mine. I watch everybody's. Like, you know, I, I'm trying to be a sponge to this and I'm trying to take in as much data as I can from everybody. Like, okay, well, Gabe's doing this, this X, Y, and Z. You know, this torque's high, this torque's mid, this torque's high. Well, what's he doing to create that? What are the movement patterns? And then, you know, we take even, and this is where, I don't know if it's me or every long driver or whatever it may be, but we kind of get a little psycho with like, okay, well, I go into coming from a training background and personal training and you know, squatting and deadlifting and stuff like that, you know, well, what's Gabe's body type, you know, what is right. his background? What is his, um, you know, ancestry? What could his hip joints look like to be able for him to do something that someone else can't or vice versa? You know, if we have a hip socket here and you come from a specific descent, while well, your hip socket might look like this. And so for you to rotate here is going to be a lot more difficult. Now, for you to keep your right foot, right toe down on the backswing with as much internal rotation, you know, it just, I, I can go, I, oh, right? Oh, like, dude, I love, I love, <laughs> man, this minutia, like the, these kind of rabbit holes is like my favorite shit. Yeah. I love and, this because you know what? It, 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 so much is of what the golf industry is, is you're being sold something, right? Right. But I, I, I think so much untapped potential is understanding who you are as a person. Yeah. And, well, you know, one of the things I've been talking about specifically on the podcast, and it's really cool that, you know, you touched on that as like a light bulb moment for yourself is, you know, I think good golf translates from when you feel good about your life and you have built in good habits and you've done good things as a person. And you talking about getting into fitness, learning that discipline, like that rewired your brain. Yeah. to kind of push you and that, you know, I'm sure your life has kind of progressed in a better way outside of golf as a yeah. result. But then what's really cool is when you start going down that lane, you realize, wait a second, like what's my magic as a human, you know? Cause I'm, I, I would love to be six, four, two twenty five some days, <laughs> right? I'm only five ten on a good day. You know, if I spike my hair, I could probably get to uh, <laughs> six, four, you know, cause it's long. Um, but you know, and I'm trying to get to, to one eighty. like I'm bulking cause I, I struggle to put on weight. So I'm now, you know, the highest I ever got was one ninety. but then I got too locked up and I couldn't turn. Right. So I'm, I've been working on mobility and now I'm, I'm trying to just bring my weight up to like 180, 183 would be my like fighting weight right um but i yeah i i totally got into that world and i'm exactly like there's so much that is untapped in our yeah. bodies that could make us play better golf and i think the benefit of figuring that out also translates outside of the game and actually just makes life better because you'll feel better you'll exist as a human better exactly and that's a huge you know like Yes, when I my life is stress free, I set a goal, I plan it around that goal. Like last year when we were chasing the ball speed stuff, right? right? I was like, okay, nobody's taken this from Kyle for the past two years. I started putting pieces together, and I'm like, you know what? I think I could give it a chip. Like I, I could probably give it a little bit of a run. If not, I'm doing nothing but improving myself at, at, right. along the way. So we, you know, we we put in these habits, and they were very regimented habits. You know, there was people are going to you did all that for that. And I'm like, but that's how I am. But, that's my goal. Yeah. Right. Well, you're yeah, but you became the third person in the world to hit a milestone that, you know, a couple of years prior was like a like a, a, a voodoo number of like, yeah, is well, this I, even is this even possible? And then this, you know, this that was, I think, 21 or 22, 22, probably or 21, yeah. somewhere in there. And now look, I was at 237 is your highest. Yeah. like, And that was that's where that whole like week was just insane in the long drive space. And unfortunately I got left out of some things because I'm not as social media as some of the guys. Uh, but you know, my peers knew that was to right. me, it's, to me, it's a big thing with my peers and the people that are very in tight to the game. Um, I don't know why the respect of my peers means more to me than social media. Maybe it's just who I am. Well, I, I, you know what I think, <laughs> I, you know what it is? I, and I think it's, it's, it comes from a fact of like, and and I can relate to this too. It's it's about putting in the work and knowing you've done the reps. Yeah. And 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 you're not cheating the work. And what I I think what's great about when you achieve a goal like that is that it's not a subjective goal, right? Right. It's it, it is very much like hard and fast. No, no, no. This is the fact. Yeah. So like I think there's comfort in being like the people that I'm competing against know, 
you can't really talk shit. So I'm good with that, <laughs> you know? Well, and you know, a lot of, and this is, I come from, you know, a little bit of an older school of things, right? There's, I'm 40. These, a lot of the guys I compete against, I think maybe Sam is 35 now. James Tate is 35, I think, or turning or just turned. But um, the majority of the guys are in the early 30s to mid 20s. And then right. we have, you know, the the super freaks coming up that are two inches taller than me, longer arms, longer levers, you know, right. and they're just starting to figure it out, uh, which that's, I love the evolution of things. I love that that's going to be part of it. And, you know, I self-admittedly say I'm on my back nine. I understand this, but the fact that I can keep up and then, you know, in turn, I don't post those things to show off. I post them. So when there's three other guys on the tee box with me, they know what could be there. And then they start, totally. they start over swinging or they start pushing too hard. And, you know, it's more of a mental advantage, not that I'm trying to take advantage of it, but I need to take certain things into perspective as I'm getting older. Cause I am not always as much as I have kept getting faster as I've gotten older, uh, which I just attribute to knowledge, to be absolutely honest. That's the biggest part. Knowledge, discipline, diligence. Like I think, you know, for my parents' generation, it, like, you know, weren't a lot of 40 year olds like you who are <laughs> units, you know, but I think, I think that's, what's cool about where we're at. Right. Is that like, People in their, you know, it was kind of like, I remember when people did their 40th birthdays and it was like, you're almost at the end. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know? like it's, well, and it's almost, you're almost uh, retired. Yeah, exactly. And to think, and to think you're swinging a golf club, 150 miles an hour at 40. Yeah. Like and that's I, incredible. I had someone in front of me, like Jeff Gavin, who's, we basically call him the freak. And he's originally from Sault Ste. Marie, lives in Stony Creek now. Um, but like he's competed at this level you know, and like he made the top 16 at Worlds. I think he was 52 years old or 51 years old, something Unreal. like that. And, you know, Eddie Fernandez is kind yeah, of. Yeah, fast Eddie. I I, know, I, I I love that, though. Paving the way for, you know, it's age is just what you let it be. It's not, you know, what you it's just a number, really, if you keep yourself together. And that's right. that was another big, you know, when that injury did happen, I, I reflected. I had time because I couldn't walk for six weeks. Um but I just reflected back and I'm like, well, what are the guys doing in front of you that you aren't doing, right? right. And it was that re reinvigoration of like, okay, well, you were the only one to have a beer at dinner the night before. <laughs> Top 16 guys out for dinner. I'm the only one having a beer. Okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're eating very specifically. They're doing things that I was doing when I was in training and where yep. when I was in my fitness side of it. And then so that I think, you know, I, that injury, yes, it was awful, but it was another massive learning curve for me to be able to be like, OK, like these are implements of steps we need to now take to get into those you know positions and treat our body a certain way. And that's right. where, you know, like I've always been a big guy as far as well, I haven't always been a big guy. My nickname was Bone Man growing up because I was so skinny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I found the gym and I found food. Right. And I, I learned again. Right. And I think that's just been a constant thing now in my life where, you know, if I want to perform better, it's not just what I do while I'm at practice. It's really preparing to practice and preparing your mental side of things. When I'm going into a speed session, that's three days in advance of planning, you know, of sleep, right. nutrition, hydration, you name it. Um, and it's just things where guys, you know, like meditation, Wim Hof breathing, stuff like that. Guys are like, well, I'm like, I'm not I'm not leaving anything unturned. Like this yeah. is, we're going to oh, find what's working, that. right? Like, I love that gonna, so much. We're going to find, we're going to find whatever fruit we can within the time yeah. we're allowed and we're going to use it. And, you know, like I, I just, I try not to stop every day doing and learning something or watching something or, you know, having an aha moment that I can mm -hmm. then carry with me to, you know, wherever it be the next step. Um, but that's, just evolution as a human, I feel. And yeah, when, Dude, that's, that's, I that. love that mindset. It's And it's very inspiring. And you know what? I didn't, uh, you know, I think it maybe is a shame that you aren't as big, as, as forward on social because I think it, it just, just like the passion. I love, like, I love it. Like I could, you know what I mean? I could feel, I like just knowing how in depth, like that's so awesome. Because, oh, okay. So anyway, so <laughs> I've got, it's funny because a lot of my questions actually, 
are so in line with what this. So first thing I want to talk about is 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 to jump into just kind of segueing off this because you've touched on so many things there. Is so you're in your off season right now. Yeah. Right. So coming off, you come off, you know, world championships. What does an off season for you look like? Well, because uh, because you you clearly have a lot of process, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, so now you've got to get that that one percent better that you're going to try and find right, right. now. What so, is that? What is that for you? You know, for me, it's I have this this thing where I don't have to be fast in December, January. Uh, you know, well, we'll say November, December, January, so I can work on a different phase of training. I can, you know, rehab certain injuries or certain things that have kind of popped up over the season, take time to get those back in check. Um, Essentially, me and my strength conditioning coach, because I'm not selfish enough to think that I can do all my own work, I I hire it out um, to people I trust, obviously. So my physio happens to be my CSCS. And so we basically started a plan. Well, okay, when's the season start? Okay, potentially March. We don't have a schedule yet, but we're potentially March. So let's build our progress for the off season over that. And, you know, he has to keep me in check because I want to go, go, go. And I, I bring myself back and I have to remember, okay, being fast in December doesn't get you a paycheck. Being fast right. in January, right? And there's... It's very hard, especially I'll give it at my age, to keep that number on the throttle for half the year, right? Like, you know, you can hang out at, I can hang out at 150 all year, but if I want to get to that 160, you know, top gear for a longer period of time, I can't spend as much time at 150. I need to take the other time to build the muscle. Basically, it's it's hypertrophy periodization where we go you know, hypertrophy, strength, power, velocity. That's really Mm -hmm. velocity, speed. I just like the term velocity training with the baseball guys. It's an easier uh, acronym to use. But that's really been the, you know, we're kind of sliding into the power phase now. Um, But so far, you know, I've been able to maintain weight, put on a little weight, because that's always the gear in the off season is to gain a little because during the season, it's just not going to be capable. You're burning too many calories during the week hitting balls, right. um, especially at the high rate of force that you're hitting balls. It's, you know, I'll burn more calories in an hour hitting driver than I would playing 36 holes of golf, right? It's just wild. <laughs> that's um, wild. And, and, and how many times a week are you hitting balls in the off season? Uh, depends. So that stretch basically once, but it's not even, it's just going and staying and moving. Like I'll play just to, on just to feel, just to feel the movement. Yeah. And then work on a few mechanical things that you think that could be worked upon certain pressures, certain paths, stuff like that. Um, you know, angles, I'm a big thing with certain angles needing to be in certain spots, uh, okay. to allow the pressure to be pushed into certain areas to then deliver in specific way um more effortlessly essentially if the pressures are wound in the right spots they can be released you know simpler without as much resistance um and then yeah so once a week roughly maybe in i think in this well i had to do an event down in west palm in december uh, a charity outing so i took a few swings the week before that and i think i went out there i hit it three second longest drive at 383 um, and the longest was 385. So I was like, you know, we're still, we're still yeah, there. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, I got beat by who a person I think is going to likely be one of the top people for the years to come. Uh, I'll leave his name out. If he listens, he'll know who he is. Um, <laughs> but you know, we're just kind of, we're trying to keep it, you know, I, I like to hover the ball speed in like that 215 to 220, maybe touch 220 once during a session. Right. Um, which is when I look back, kind of funny because that used to be like the top end goal. Now it's just like yeah. the bottom. The You're like, ah, oh, it's just my maintenance. Yeah, just, like, just chipping it. Yeah. So you know, now actually today, after we're done later this afternoon, I'm gonna head into Burlington. Um, I'm gonna give myself probably 70 balls, give or take, and I'm gonna start building my speed endurance starting today. Um, so by okay. speed endurance, it's basically, you know, you try and keep it above 95 percent 
this is my training and how I do things yeah. and how I essentially am training clients. You try and keep it roughly above 95% for about 70% of your 70, 70 drivers essentially, and then work up from there. I never really go beyond a hundred uh, until this, we're getting ready for the season, but then it's more of a periodized hundred multiple times a week. Um, because we have to hit back to back days. So you have to, it's very difficult. Uh, it's not something that we quite have figured out. No one's really figured out the CNS on this absolute yet. Um, but it's, we have to hit hundred balls day one. We have to hit hundred, well, 30 balls in comp, but you might as well call it hundred cause you're warming up, staying loose, everything else in between day right. two, you're going to be doing the same thing. And then sometimes depending on the schedule day three, you might have to hit even more, uh, which is, which is wild to me. And this is where, I, you know, one of the things I, I noticed is like, you guys are almost like pitchers, but you don't get your five days off. Yeah. And, and I was going to ask you, you know, cause it sounds like, you know, you guys are on ball counts. You got to basically get to your top V load in order to be your best. Yep. But then they get to kind of do an arm care day. They get to chill in the dugout and then five <laughs> days later, and then they get to pick up their check for 20 million. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and it, and it, it's, it's wild to me that it's like, you know, having, having worked on speed myself, like, you know, I can, when I was kind of pushing it, I could feel like doing back-to-back -back speed days was like, it's, it's not, it's not it. Right? Right. That like, like you can feel it on your body, especially, you know, being 32 now, it's like, you, you feel it a little more than when yep. you do when you're younger. <laughs> how do you guys, how do you manage that? Like that, that, cause it, am I off base saying like you guys are like pitchers or is that basically it's, what it's kind of like? It's, I'd say we're, we're high pitch count closers. That's, okay. that's kind of the, you know, you have, yeah, true. You know, that's where, you know, we go out, a, we yeah. blitz it. And for us, you know, when I say blitz it, our round robins are generally an hour and a half. You get five sets of six balls bracketed into that hour and a half. Right. Um, so you kind of look at it as like maybe a mid reliever a little bit more, but you're a yeah. mid reliever that throws nothing but fastballs. <laughs> <laughs> just, just heat, <laughs> just gas. Yeah. Um, no changeups in our sense. No, no. But I mean, I will say because I did throw baseballs for quite a while, the baseball arm throwing, especially someone with myself who didn't have great mechanics throwing a baseball was much more body arm soreness than right. hitting a golf ball. Um, the implement of the golf club is, I mean, our drivers basically weigh under 300 grams at this point, total weight, depending on your grip and your head configuration. But most shafts that guys are using are running like under 55 grams. Um, some right. guys as low as 39 grams. So that's where, you know, our total weight of applying, like, you know, club moved isn't overly crazy. But when you take 100 or 295 grams and start moving it at 155 miles an hour, you know, it's kind of, it adds up over time to, you know, needing to be strong in end range of motion is kind mm -hmm. of where, you know, Tom House, TPI, Pitching, well, Tom, Tom House guru. is one of the Tom House is one of the best follows on Twitter. Right, so you get Tom House, and a lot of his pitching, you know, stuff that he's done is about after you let go of the ball, right? Like the pitching release and his overweight ball holds and stuff like that. Where I find there to be great value in that for certain things when it comes to golf, because you have to be able to control, you know, you got to be able to put on the brake and then control everything. Right. So the shaft A isn't bouncing off your back, but also B, when your ligaments are fully stretched out at the end of the swing and you're rotating through the ball, you're not going to be putting yourself in a harmful position, we'll say. Um, but yeah, that's the mid reliever. That's probably as close as it gets, but a mid reliever that throws nothing but gas and you have to train for it. There's no way to train for it in right. the gym. There's no... There's, from what I found, there is no possible way to do it, but to do it, but you have to do it in a way that is no different than a periodization program. So you kind of slowly build through, you know, a marathon runner doesn't go run a marathon six days a week. Right. Right. And a hundred meter sprinter doesn't run the hundred meters six days a week all out. So it's building that capacity is essentially what you need to be able to do. Some guys just are freaks of nature like uh, Kyle Berkshire's ball count and my ball count 
drastically different. Uh, Martin, I hung out with Martin for, well, we're really good friends, but we spent pretty much a week together. We went to the Greenbrier, did an event there. We stayed in Virginia, did a video with Carter, um, the DOD King. Then we went down to Tennessee. Like yeah. it was a busy week. And for me, that's not my, I'm usually like, we practice, we go home, we eat, we rest, we hot tub, we X, Y, Z to recovery. And Martin was just go, go, go. And I'm like, well, man, you're the world champ. So I'm not going to like argue. And you're built a lot mentally different than I am. Like, I think that's why we get along very well is because we're not the same in a lot of things, but we also can understand that you don't have to be to be friends. Um, but he was just, you know, okay, we got to go to the range. We got to find a range. We got to do, and it was every day. And, you know, his, what he was doing, and I knew what he was doing because he's talked to me about it, but he was prepping himself for the four day gauntlet of the world championships right. starting in August. Right. And that tournament was in October. So he was prepping his body to be able to go four days in a row like 16 right. weeks out. And for me personally, I could, it's too far away. It's just, you know, it was too, too long for someone. And like you'll, me. you'll end up kind of on the diminishing um, returns by yes. the time. Yeah. You know, where his peak is there, I would probably personally 10 weeks at most is when I started. Um, but I also understood like, you know, day one, you don't need to be, you know, when you're at, you know, a high level, Generally, day one, you swing at 90, 92, 93%, which for me is going to be at that point, probably in the 147 to 150 range, hit solid balls into the grid, you'll get through to the next day. And you don't ever need to finish first in a bracket. It doesn't get you any advantage because they're all right. reset the next day on world ranking. Right. Um, so it's just really survive in advance, survive in advance, survive in advance till you get to that you know, I'll say 32 to 16, that starts to put pressure on. And then when you're in the 16, it's just a slaughterhouse. Like every guy there hits it over 220. Every guy dumps it down the middle 400. Like it's who gets a bounce, who hits it when it needs to be hit. And the right gust know, of wind. Yeah. Like, you know, we touched, <laughs> we touched, I got eliminated by 25 points. Okay. But I also tied my first set with James Tate at 388 and a half or 389 yards. And the balls were three inches apart at 388, 89 yards, yeah. right? We split those points. We both get 150 instead of me getting 200. It's me getting in versus me being eliminated. And, right. you know, it's just how the story unfolds. Like it was, you know, I needed to win my last set. I did. Sean Johnson needed to not win his last set. He ended up winning. Then that put Justin James just needing to put a ball in play. I'm, JJ's not going to not put a ball in play. Like <laughs> I know I've known him long enough. It's, it's when, as soon as that came down to it, I'm like, yeah, I'm done. Now it's just acceptance. That's wild. And, <laughs> and you know what? I, and I think this is, this is what's so cool, you know, and I think maybe the casual fan doesn't understand just what you, where, what you guys are doing, you know, to get to this level. Cause I think, I think some guys think you guys just are, you know, you, you go kind of how you approached your first event. You just, yeah. you, you just rock up and you just brood it. Right. Yep. And, and I think it's just so cool to see just how much finesse is happening and such, a, and it, because it is a lot of that brute force. Like you guys are just yep. trying to, to pound it, but that's so cool. So now taking all the stuff you're doing physically, right? Yeah. What is the mental side of long drive? You know, cause I understand like on, <laughs> on the golf course, I understand what the mental side is like, but when you have six balls and you, you know, there's, and you're playing some of these games of like, I got to just survive the set. Right. Right. right? And then the other piece too, to all this is that, you know, you can't do long drive and just bunt it out there and get through when your body's not feeling it. Right. You gotta like, that's the difference with golf. It's like, if I don't have my A stuff that day, like I can just bunt it around. I don't have to, I don't have to crush it. So how do you mentally now, how does, how does that all factor in? Well, that's, uh, to me, I think for a lot of young guys who are, you know, just great athletes, right? They're just, they come out of the woodwork, they show up, they have great mechanics, they, they hired a great coach right out the get-go, they have no scar tissue. They have, so they don't, the mental side for them, they just get up there, they hit their six balls, they're fine, right? Okay. They don't have years of bad bounces, OB sets, shitty things happening per se. Right. Um, and so they kind of freewheel it, which 
you know, I honestly think is the best way to go about it. You just, you got to go up there not caring what, what happens. You kind of just have to stay within yourself and by stay within yourself is just don't worry about what other guys are doing on the tee box. Um, I know there are mind games played on the tee box. Guys will yell at balls that aren't that good. And, you know, they try and throw. And then you have certain, you know, crowd people screaming for a certain individual. And, you know, but my best sets. And I mean, we have music playing in the background, the whole thing, right? My best sets ever. I haven't heard a thing. Like, and it's yeah. not that it's not happening. It's just you're, no, you're so you're just... locked in that... You know, you're just literally just in the zone to a point where it doesn't matter what's happening around you or who's making what screaming, whatever it is. You're just so zeroed in. The The prep for that is, I think, the most difficult part because we're especially like the more events you're at. Right. Like when I was younger, I would only go to a couple events a year. Wouldn't be a big deal. Whatever. Nobody really cared. I wasn't that good. No big deal. But as you become, you know, in this top tier, you're at every event, you build your friendships, you have your buddies, and you have everyone else that you talk to and hang out with and, you know, all of that along the way. And it's not letting yourself be distracted during that time, you know, like staying in the zone for as long as you can, you know, while you're there. And that's, it's hard to always do. I mean, it happened to me at Worlds this year where, you know, I think it was around a 32. I had to go into a playoff to make the top 16. And it was a three-man playoff. And I was, you know, like, okay, like, yeah, I, I can be one of the top two guys here. Like, this shouldn't be a problem. And I went OB, but so did one of the other guys. And so basically our one buddy, Bryce, for Plank, gets through by hitting it like 362. Like he hit a spatula out there and right. got through and he was kind of like laughing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm laughing, but I'm also pissed off because A, I got lucky that the other guy went OB as well. But now you have, they're deciding, okay, well, how's the playoff going to go? Is it going to be six balls? Head to, whatever. They're debating whether it's going to be three ball or six ball. And in that time, I just sat there and I'm like, I don't care it's over on the first ball. Like I totally like just flipped a switch and I didn't just tell myself. I looked up at Sarah. I told Sarah, I looked at the ball caller. I told my ball caller and I'm like, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm ending it on the first ball. He's going to have to do his absolute best ever all time to catch it. And oddly enough, I did do it on the first ball, but he also hit a very, very, I beat him by a yard. Let's just, I beat him by one yard and he went, I went 396 to his 395 and, you know, I give him all the kudos in the world. He stepped up just like I did and we went to battle and it was probably my favorite set of the entire championship, even though it was mono a mono. And, you know, obviously I felt for him after because I know he left it all on the line and he went out there and I just went up to him on the driving range after him. Like, that's long drive, dude. Like you're right here. You're right with us. Yeah. You're right with one of the, with the best, with the best there is. And you just didn't get the bounce. Like it's just part of the game. But that, that's where the mentality, you know, you catch a shitty bounce in golf or like you go flag hunting and you hit the flag and it bounces into the bunker. I mean, that can happen in long drive any day of the week. Like it's right. And it, and it does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's because it's you know at one point you know you kind of wonder is it, is it freeing to have six balls, but at the same time, every ball you hit that doesn't land is almost like a, <laughs> it's like well I only got only got five and I got, oh, I got, you know only got one. It's like there's no freer feeling than hitting your first ball well in play. Right, like right. It, you know, and I say well because. It, I don't, you can't bunt it out there 340. Like if, if, no. you're, if you're trying to like get through to the next round, hitting a ball, like dumpster fire ball in play at like 320, 330, it's useless. You might as well just hit it OB because it's only going to be good for 25 points. So now right. if you only need 25 points, okay, sure. But more often than not, you need more. And I mean, so, the, so, so to build on that, is there a long drive version of the, the fairway finder that is... <laughs> Like, you know, when, you know, like, like, do you guys have the, those, like, how many different shots are you, are you there, really playing? There used to be. So okay. when we used to be in a different format before this round robin format, which I do believe is still the most fair, um, there used to be double elimination format. 
So you'd be, depending on how many guys were in the event, how big the tee box was, whatever. We'll just say there was four guys in, in your, your set. Um, generally, only two would hit at a time back then. And so the two longest would move on. The other two would be eliminated. Well, if you're in the third slot and the first two guys go up and they go OB, well, now you just have to put one in play and you're going to move on. Right. right. So there was a lot more. And I think that's what's kind of led to this this massive amount of speed being um, adapted into the new long drive was there's a lot more freewheeling allowed, even though, you know, it's a different format. But before, like, let's just say you go OB twice in an entire tournament, you're eliminated. You right. could go OB twice now in the same set, win three times and you're on to the next day. So it's it's a much different game being played now. Interesting. Uh, than it was when I first started. There was much more of that type of, you know, grid finder, put one in play, then build on it. You know, there were certain guys that they ate up long drive because they could do that. You know, I think Jason Zubak has the best stat ever in long drive. I believe he went OB once at a world championship wow. in his career. <laughs> wow like it, it's something ridiculous like that where i'm like i've gone ob twice like back to back and then had, yeah, to win, yeah, like, had to win three sets in a row and sarah's behind me just stressing out and i'm just sitting there, ah, i got it meanwhile in my head i'm like you better hit it good <laughs> but that's you know it, it's a different game now and i'm one of the very few that is still around in the open division that has played it both ways right um and yeah, I think that's been the big, but you know, that technology, us moving and learning to be able to move lighter shafts better. Uh, that's the other harder part with now just putting one in play. Our equipment is geared to like 100% go at all times, right? We don't, we don't really bring, um, well, some guys do, I guess, but we don't really bring like that play driver to the tee box to just hit right and play um, right. very certain situations maybe but not on a regular basis interesting and then with now with the new format because you know i remember watching like the jamie sidlowski because you know what he was one of the guys that first got me into long drive because he's not yeah. a big dude right, right? Absolutely. so as, so as someone who's not a big dude i was like cool yeah. you know um but now you know they got you guys lined up four in four in a row is there is there a because I know just moving in a normal tee box, moving certain positions changes your angle drastically. Oh, yeah. Is there, you know, like, like how much does that affect you on the tee box going like, oh, I'm in the, I'm in this slot and it, it's a weird angle or it feels yeah. weird. Because, you know, you know, just getting your start lines right and especially downrange like that, like how much is that affecting you? Yeah, I'm a big fan of slot two and three right in the middle. I, those are always my preference. Um, I'm not a big at the ends, like on right. one and four guy, but it, it absolutely does. Like you, you think you're moving across a tee box. What is it? 40 feet roughly. Yeah. Like that's, that's you know, tangible. Like, yeah. Especially like if you're having some balls, like say you move the ball left to right, we're on a left to right wind. You're on the very first slot. Okay. Well now you got to start your ball outside the grid for it to come back. Right. right. Now say you're that same guy in slot four. But now you have to cut across the grid. And essentially, if we do physics, shortest distance is a straight line. You're eating up yardage, moving your ball left to right, uh, which is why I've always been a big believer in trying to hit it as straight as I can, because the shorter the distance, unless I have to hit a very specific spot on the grid. But the straighter, less least amount of access you can put on the ball, the faster it's going to get to point B. Um, so that's kind of... There is a big factor in that, and it's not really talked about because guys a lot of times are just kind of like so zoned in where it's like, right. you know, you're picking, you essentially got to start depending on where you, you basically start where your ranking is for the world tour. So depending on where you are in your group, you might start in slot two. And then if you start in two, you move three, four, one, two, essentially. And then, you know, if you're, and that could even change, like you might go from back to two to one, depending if you're like the highest ranked guy in the group kind of thing. Um, but that's where, you know, you really have to find your comfort zone very quickly, especially in those first few rounds. Once you get through each slot and kind of have your targets picked out and have a certain sight line, 
And it, I mean, that has happened to me like many times where I'm very uncomfortable the first day. And then by the time the second day rolls around, I've kind of settled in and walked through, you know, won my group straight to right. the top 16 kind of thing where the first day I was like, OB, OB, win, win, third, get in by a couple points and then show up the next day and just be like, hey, that's my line. I know it now. Boom, 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 boom. Win every set and away you go. So that's, it does play a big factor and it's just a matter of, you know, having, like you said, right, it's finding those exact lines and not wanting to move the ball or not trying to move the ball too much in either direction, if you can, obviously my right. hits happen, <laughs> especially. Yeah, because I, I feel like if I was in the the four slot, which is a, what, the far, that's far left, right? Far like right, I, yeah. or sorry, which one, so far which right. one's far right? So yeah, so. So then if I'm in the – so what's, which one is the most to the left? Like I would feel like if I'm a fade guy, I'd be trying to hit like slinger hooks all day just to just to get the yeah. into the grid versus being, I guess, in the four slot. Now I'm trying to hit big cuts to try and just put one in play. Like yes. Yeah. Well, and you can hear like there is certain advantages for certain people depending on the slot they're in, depending on what right. the wind's doing, right, and what time of day it is. And, and how nerdy I mean, are you getting on conditions? Like well, how we're, we're, how into the weeds are we in on conditions? Like are we as using far as we can go? So like, like give me give me oh this is my favorite shit. Like <laughs> what, like what are we like like are we using different apps? Are we bringing our own weather gear to the? No, I, like, mean, what, I don't like, I don't get into like barometric pressure or anything like that. Right. Um, but there really is like and Sarah laughs at me all the time when when we get the event schedule and we're about a week out. I'm constantly checking the weather. I'm constantly seeing what the wind's doing. I'm constantly seeing when the gusts, like when the wind's supposed to pick up, what what right. time of day the wind's supposed to pick up. Because this is the funny part about events is, you know, generally mid-afternoon, the winds are always going to be a little higher. The air is going to be drier. The ground's going to, you know, be harder from being dried out yep. throughout the day. Kind of just like getting an afternoon tea time, right? You're always going to hit it a little further. But <clears throat> in that case, we get some places like Memphis, Tennessee, where it's stagnant all morning do awful and you go out there and you hit a ball like 380 in the morning and that ball is murdered like you can't hit that ball better and right. then guys come out in the afternoon who are 15 miles an hour slower than you the wind picks up the ground is dried out the air density has gotten a lot thinner and they're hitting it 400 yards no problem and you're just like yeah, it, it, you know, the general public's like, well, he hit it 400. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's no different than the guys playing right. on the tour who, you know, or let's just say during the, the Open Championship who get the morning time without yep. any wind. And then the afternoon guys get totally shafted because a storm blew in off the ocean and they're getting hammered with rain and the winds change at 180 degrees. And, you know, the nice the nice part is in the way our system works now, you're only against those guys for that hour and a half for the day. Yeah, that's cool. Right. So that's, that's another reason why we've kept it that way. Um, some things you have no control over, right? Like if a gust of wind comes up halfway through your set and you hit a ball on your first ball and this guy hit a good ball on his fourth ball, well, he just picked the per perfect time to hit a good ball. Like, it, yeah. you, and you didn't, but yeah. We, and the, and the, yeah, we know wild. as players, like we can feel it. Like that's, there's one thing I've become very sensitive to even playing regular rounds of golf is the wind. Um, cause it being a naturally having like a high ball flight because of ball speed and, you know, yep. let's just say compression relations that have to come along with that. It's very hard to trap a ball at 170 miles an hour, uh, with an iron and keep it on the planet. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, with long drive, it's like, a two mile an hour gust and, you know, 300 less RPM backspin, you know, you're might looking at 15 yards. <laughs> and are you, are you manipulating your delivery on different winds? Are you saying, yes. you know, do you, you're mostly, feeling mostly T height, mostly T. Okay. T height is, is um, that's, that's what the T height's obviously going to dictate my delivery. Right. So, that's so down, like, you know, downwind, you'll tee it up super high and you can just be like, let's like, <laughs> let's go yeah. and into the wind. You'll kind of tee it up a little lower. Yeah, that's where I think the one the one thing that, you know, I can't say I have, but 
a few of us have is we've played golf in our life. And so some long drivers come in and they've never played golf and they don't understand ball dynamics and hitting down. And, you know, not that we ever are actually hitting down, but we're talking like a 10 AOA versus like a four AOA yeah. type of thing. Um, so I think that's, <clears throat> that's a big, you know, differentiator in who can, and then being able to control your spin with that delivery. Cause some guys, you know, myself particular, I've never been a very high spin guy because my delivery has always been very, I almost have too little dynamic loft, to be absolutely honest. Even if I deliver it at like 10, like I got a two degree driver, two and a half degree driver, I deliver it at 10, my dynamic loft is like 13.1. Like <laughs> I'm adding nothing extra besides right. my AOA. But on the other side of it, my ball speed is so fast because of that blunt delivery of club face. Right. Yeah, right? sledgehammering that's, it. Yeah, that's what's been able to have my ball speed be so high without having, you know, I might have swung over 160 on TrackMan like once or twice. And I'm always like, ah, it's a misread. Like it probably doesn't happen. But other guys will swing over 160 consistently. I believe it's a path thing and the way it's reading. Um, but the ball speeds are within a few miles per hour or less in some cases, depending on how the ball is struck. But that's a whole nother, I mean, we get into that stuff for another three hours. <laughs> like, it, Oh, dude, I love it so much. Um, so now taking everything you're doing physically and mentally and packaging all together, now you're in your off season, you know, where does where does your equipment now play a role? Like I, I remember when I first met you, I don't think you were with Callaway, and and you've since moved to Callaway. Yeah. Um, for the long drive heads, where where is your? You know, I know you you play Acra quite a bit. Yeah. Um, how, how does how does your equipment situation now match up with everything you're doing? Because clearly, clearly, you definitely thought about this part. Yeah. You think about everything else. I, and this is where being a club junkie at heart, like growing up. I was part of all the forums. Like I was part of Toronto golf nuts before it was Toronto golf nuts. Like when it was no called four G E A, I would club swap when I was like 17, 18 years old with guys. I'd run down to the post office in my hometown, mail out this driver, get another one in the mail. Oh, I love it. Like <clears throat> me and my brother were just ridiculous. Like my brother had, and you might remember this, but it might've been before you got really into golf. Remember TaylorMade had the 300 series drivers. Mm -hmm. My brother ended up finding the TaylorMade 300 tour, which is always referenced to as the Holy Grail. Yep. And we literally just started like building a collection. We had like 510 TPs, very common. My brother ended up with a wow. 5, 580 TP tour only. And then we just, you know, I had uh titleist 975 lff which was a tour only and we just we turned into these club junkie you know this shaft and that shaft and this got it so, so this it, is this is in the blood <laughs> this for a is while. just and even to this day we'll like just message each other random golf stuff like so okay so then this <laughs> also makes a lot of sense because i saw the most recent iron build you did Yes. <laughs> and that is a club junkie iron build. <laughs> that is a when I saw that, I went, that is a textbook club junkie yeah. iron build. So we, we can get it. We, uh, what is just quickly take <laughs> okay. us through this iron build. Then. So, so Acra, because of the relationship I built with Acra, uh, I'm basically solely hitting Acra through the bag. Um, we, we, they did a custom set for me. So we just did it as my hockey team colors growing up as a kid in my hometown, which were essentially like early 90s Buffalo Sabres colors because we were in Elks Lodge with like the gold, blue, purpley blue, whatever it was, colors. Same thing as the yep. Buffalo Sabres. So <clears throat> the guy at Acra designed these iron shafts and put my hockey team logo on it. And I had a designer friend from back home send the logo down and all this stuff. So then I'm like, okay, I, I can't just put anything on these. Like, I'm probably not going to play them regularly, but I got to. So a good friend of mine, kind of who's been a golf friend forever, Nathan, he had this set of Mizuno TP19s that he found. He's just as bad as I am. He's, <laughs> he's got the sickness. Like, yeah, he's. I think he's got a set of national custom build customs. Like, he's gone all out. Um but he's got the sickness, absolutely. And so at the, when I came home from Worlds in 2019, he thought it was so awesome and then sent me just like a full bag, 
like a mirror carry bag with all these things just like hidden in the pockets and all this stuff. And part of it was those Mizuno TP19 heads that were completely refurbished, like brand new, <sighs> completely redone. And if people don't know, like those Mizunos were designed by Faldo to win the British Oak, blah, 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 or in the early yeah. 90s. Um, so they'd been sitting in my basement for just waiting four years, five years. Finally, this opportunity came up. I'm like, let's do it. Obviously, put on the white super stroke cord grips because I've always liked harder cord grips. Yeah. And then just went up to Accra up in Kingston for the day. And my buddy Ken, who's there, built them up. And, you know, that just, you know, started to add to everything else. And of course, while I'm there, I'm testing this, trying that. We're going totally. through different builds. We're going through different grip weights. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it fits right into the mold. And it's funny because I walked into the warehouse because Accra now is owned by True Temper. Mm -hmm. So all the True Temper, everything, Project X, everything, uh, steel fiber, all the Accra stuff uh, is all in the warehouse at Accra. Um, so we're walking through the warehouse, let alone like all the true sports hockey equipment. So right. me being a kid that grew up in Northern Ontario, happening. he's walking me through and I'm just like sitting like a kid in a candy store thinking this is the, if I was 16 years old again, this would have been, I'm like, it's awesome. But younger me would have been like, that's that NHL player stick. That's that NHL. Yeah, it's yeah. all the pro stock stuff. Right. Yeah. And yeah, like it, the build and the relationship with Acura kind of came by fluke. Um, it was, I seen a hitter who helped Acra do some stuff or helped someone who was with Acra using this shaft in Mesquite at the beginning of the season last year. And he performed well. And I was kind of on my way out of the relationship I had currently with a certain shaft company. Um, and I just sent a message, made a connection. And they're like, yeah, do you want to try something? I'm like, yeah, sure. So they sent it and... I built it because I build all my own stuff in the basement and basically well, all my own drivers. I'm not, I'm not willing to touch graphite iron shafts and stuff. That's why I went up to Kingston yeah. to build those. But that's, that's really cool though. So you're, you're in control of your driver build. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, very sensitive to head weight and stuff like that. So it's okay. very, it has to be a very specific feel. Um, so when I built up this driver with the Acura FX140 M0, which is essentially like a junior flex, um, like the whippiest one they make relative to an auto flex, essentially, just with a much different profile. Um, I set my highest ball speed the first day I tried it. And I was like, and I was progressing at the time. So it, was, it wasn't it was a huge shock, but the fact that I could take a brand new club that I had never hit before and within like the first 45 minutes set my all-time best ball speed i was like okay there's okay. something here yeah um and then two weeks after that i broke kyle's ball speed record for 48 hours and then our relationship just kind of bloomed from there and we tried this tested this tried the whole tz series tried you know and it, it keeps falling back to the one shaft um there's a few things in the works. I can, I, I'll say cool. that. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, it's been great to have that kind of support and that kind of backing from a Canadian company. Um, yeah. And just, you know, like <clears throat> the certain things that have happened along the way, even with, you know, TXG did a video about that shaft because I had used it and they carried it and they did a comparison with the Autoflex to it. And then, they had a bunch of sales at Acura because of it. So it was, I felt like I was, I was adding to the company, um, let alone them helping me making progressing me be better. It was kind of like helping everybody. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, we're always looking for that next little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit more, you know, accurate. Like we always want the perfect package. Um, right. So yeah, hopefully we're we're gonna be working on some next steps here shortly. And I was supposed to go up on the weekend, but the weather down here was pretty awful. So we just yeah, it's been off, it's been up. awful across the board up here yeah. too. <clears throat> but yeah, it's you know when it comes to tinkering, I'm probably over tinkering to be absolutely honest. Aren't we all? Um, aren't we all just a little yeah, bit over? It, you know, that's where it, it's 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 so difficult for me to like, if I was still playing golf more so like, and just golf, 
I yeah. would be, I'd be awful. Like that year, that 2020 year with COVID, I had a basement bag full of this and that, <laughs> and none of it was long drive related. Like I still- No, I remember you were using, you had the slider, you had the, the SLDR driver yeah. when I played with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I finally flattened it, but that thing was a unit, man. It, I loved that thing. Yeah. You nutted it. It was low spin, high launch. I mean, yeah. I had a tour model that I could turn down to six degrees, but like- that thing, I could launch it at 12, spin it at 1600 on the golf course, and it just floated forever. And I didn't even have to hit it that hard. Like it was just, it took off and it was right. gone. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I, I do, I, I try this. I try that, that's that. That's cool that you're, that you're in charge of your own builds. So you're, so you're using the, the Paradigm long drive head. Yeah. And, yeah. and the stock loft on that is what? Uh, uh, we get them between four to four and a half on the stick. And then you're turning them down. You have the uh, the long drive sleeve and you're turning yeah. them down too. Yeah. I'll go to yeah. two and a half. And then we play with the head weights too, right? Like they have the five, yeah. five gram plug in the back. When I was doing the ball speed stuff, I took the five gram plug out, put a two gram plug in and then put like four grams of lead. I, I asked them to send me a lighter head because I like to play head at around 190, 191 grams uh, without right. the sleeve. So it comes out to about 200 total. Um, yeah, I've seen some guys not even have the the plug in. Yeah, and, and that's what's so crazy. Like, we're all so different. Like, I cannot hit Martin's driver the way Yeah, see, yeah, and he was it, the one I saw. It. Like, he's got, is his just stupid light? It's, I, I, I don't want to speak absolutes, but I think it hovers in the 883 to 184 gram. And, okay, that's light, yeah. You know, his driver shaft, I believe, is between 39 and 40 grams. And then he plays an ultralight, extra small jumbo max grip. So his total build, uh, it can't be over 275, 200, you know, maybe 80 grams, 90, right. not not even 90. So I think that grip's like 35 or 36. It's like a, it's like a it's, fly yeah. swatter. Yeah. But that's, you know, when I was in Germany last year, we went twice we flew to Munich to see Martin the one time and shot a YouTube video and whatever. Yeah. I, was, um, I checked that video. But like we were, we were literally, he's like, I didn't bring my clubs. Like it wasn't a golf trip, but we just right. flew down to it's flying within Europe's amazing because you can get anywhere in an oh, hour yeah. and it's so cheap and it's not a big hassle. Like it is going to Pearson. Um, no, <laughs> but it was, you know, he's like, Oh, just use one of mine. And he had just got the paradigm heads in at the time and he had all the weights out and, whatever. And I'm like, I, dude, I need weight. I can't swing this. I don't feel it. I don't know where it is in space. I, I can't feel the head. And we're still talking like these things are probably swing waiting out into the ease, but it's just, I need to, it's like having the lure at the end of the fishing rod. Like, yeah. You yeah. Know, you seem, I, you I seem had to know, feel it. You need to locate it somehow. Yeah. So that's cool. where, yeah, like there's so many guys with so many different setups and that's, that's kind of the part I love about the game is, you know, it's, there's no one perfect shaft for everybody. And, you know, even between a couple of grams of head weight, let alone how we all deliver the club, how our hands go through impact, you know, all of that stuff, like it's so different. And, and we see it in golf all the time. Like, yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to fit a guy that's four across and six down, but, you know, they'll be able to take some spin off somehow. But I mean, if you can get that guy, you know, zeroed out in any way, shape or form or closer to zero, <laughs> those are automatic yards just by correcting path and pressure, really. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, there's not really any long drive guys that are that across and down. I mean, there'll yeah. be some guys that are a little across coming from baseball and stuff, uh, especially the hitters. They'll be right. across, but they'll still be up but they're still, right. you know, and that's, everyone's figuring it out, right? The pitchers, the pitchers always have the best background. Like that's right. just, they know how to sequence the body, the, the kinematics and the swing. And they know how to kind of deliver it properly. And those guys are just lethal right out the gate. <laughs> like Sean Johnson, who finished second yeah. at Worlds, like just, you know, he picked up a golf club. I mean, he was a hockey player at heart. Like he took, like he lived in Colorado. He was a baseball player and then baseball and hockey and golf. He always hit it far probably because he was a pitcher and he's a bigger unit than I am. I mean, he's six, seven and just long arms, long legs, greatest guy in the world. Um, but just, yeah, he figured out how to deliver the club over the past Wild. two years. And I mean, finished second at the world championships, lost by a yard to Kyle. Like yeah. it's, you know, that's one really those, interesting. One of those I, things. It's it's crazy like that how different sports can also translate into golf. 
Oh yeah. Like, like I, you know, one of the things I've been trying to figure out for myself is like, I have a, I've, I'm, I'm faster versus how strong I am. Yep. Like actually, you know, you're more I, velocity based versus power based. Yeah. And I didn't realize like why, like, you know, f- cause I basically spent my whole twenties sitting in a studio, not lifting a thing. Right. But I spent all my teen years and everything like playing tons of volleyball, playing tons of hockey, all of these things. And it's just wild that, you know, all the, all those years of jumping, especially playing yeah. volleyball, you know, how much like my verticals yep. still, yeah, it just kind of bakes it into you as a human. So you're, yeah. you know, you're saying these guys who are pitchers and they have all these different sports in their background. It's like, it's almost like, man, if I was, if I was ever to have a kid, like I'd want to, I'd want to bake in all these sports yeah. early to, to be athletic, just to give the versatility. Cause it's wild how much that, stays with you. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, the, one of the things that I took away from when I took the TPI stuff and took the courses, became certified and all that was very much understanding, you know, they use it as kind of like your diesel fuel, your regular gas, and then your aviation fuel kind of thing. And you're kind of set to be one of those from a young age. And the more active and, you know, sports oriented you are from a younger age until puberty type of thing kind of presets those things. Um, And I was the same way. Like I was, I started playing hockey. I think my dad had me out there when I was like three. Um, and we played road hockey every day. Like it was snow banks up to our eyeballs by the time it would be like the middle of November. So we could literally play road hockey. Then you put regular hockey and then golf just happened for me by chance. It wasn't, you know, Oh, I wanted to play golf. It was like, well, the, the dads, all their, their baseball, like my dad used to pitch fast pitch windmill baseball and that league folded and all the guys are like, Oh, well, let's just start golfing. And so I got, instead of being dragged to the dugout, I got dragged to the golf course. And right. then my friend was like, oh, he would take me to like the arena park, essentially, where we gather and whatever in town. And I just hit a pitching wedge and I'm like, how do you hit this? He's like, oh, I just hit down on it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I just started smashing down on the back of a pitching wedge. And I think from that, you know, certain muscles got developed because you're a pitching wedge is generally a bit heavier than a, well, maybe not back then, but today, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> heavier than a driver. And I would, the winter I became really obsessed. I got the golf digest subscriptions for Christmas, the golf magazines. I got my first Edwin Watts book. Um, I would just go out in the, the yard with kind of my winter boots on and just try and take like small little divots off the ice in the, cause everything was just hard and ice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had like this old set of tailor-made tour model before the burner stuff, the like pillow or what was it? Like foam filled irons. And I would just take like small little chips out of the ice with like my five and six iron. So my club building those right. myths, but just, yeah, you, you build up the hand speed, the, the coordination. I mean, I came out the next year and had the terrible reverse pivot because I'm literally just leaning on my front and trying to take little chips and then right. <clears throat> from standing on ice. But that was part of the learning process. Right. And then that was the year yeah. I was like, I can hit it 300 yards whenever I want. I was like 14 years old. I don't know where it's going, but I can do it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's, that's wild. Like it just, it's so it's weird how the convergence. It's almost I, I saw a thing with Claude Harmon talking about this with Junior, saying like, just get them to swing hard, swing fast. And they said one of the hardest um, people for them to teach is a kid that specializes in golf too early. Yeah, and isn't athletic in other disciplines. Yeah, and it's it, like, yeah, it's. I it's think a that's tough, that's, a, tough body that's a big part. Is like you know with Junior golf the way where I grew up, you weren't given an option. There was no like specialization at the time in golf. Winter was a real thing and you couldn't go to Florida. I mean, my dad, we couldn't afford it. Uh, even if I was super well, good, but, but you know but, what though, even, even me growing up in Richmond Hill, we didn't think about golf. It no. was hockey time. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know, it was, it wasn't, it was, it, we, we embraced the fact that it was going to be cold and we had stuff to do outside in the cold. Exactly. And I was like, okay, we play on the tennis court until they put the net up. And then yeah. we'll go play golf or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, now, you know, I see the specialization stuff and I'm like, but there, there's going to be, I don't want to say there's going to be, because a lot of these kids who do specialize also are having fitness trainers and stuff at a very young age now. Yep. And, you know, they're becoming fully immersed in golf, which if you can't play this other sports, okay, great. Next best thing. Um but yeah, that's, it's one of those, you have to ride that fine line for a certain time. 
And especially with juniors, because you, you know, I coach a few and the, this, I don't even call it strength conditioning. I just really call it like the ability to stay athletic um, because yeah. you're, you're doing so much golf and you want to get stronger for other things. It's just going to compound to helping golf. And a lot of it is, it's not even the mobility because they're generally all super mobile, like hyper mobile yeah. to points. We are almost trying to like tighten things up a little bit, right? right? You're trying to like create a little bit tighter of an elastic band there. Yeah. You like, want uh, some resistance here. Yeah. I, and the other part I've always, you know, with working with a handful is how easily things like coordination drills and stuff like that with general athletic movement are easily forgotten. Like, something I call them like bound jumps, like bound jumping, but it's like champion strides, essentially two foot, one foot, two foot, one foot bounding as far as you can. Yeah. Essentially hopscotch for kids. Yeah. Right. And at some points I'll get teenagers that haven't really tried to do that and they try to do it and they're falling over. They can't land on one foot. And, you know, it takes them a couple of weeks to figure it out. And it's almost like the, that was something you used to do as a five-year-old, like, Boom, you didn't even think about it. Yeah. Right. Well, I started and, I started sprinting for that exact reason. Yeah. Cause I, I, I saw a stat like it was like 90 something percent of all people will never run full out again after the age of 30. Yeah. And as a kid, like you sprint everywhere. How many times a day? Yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> you know, like especially you having a brother, like you guys are, it's like oh, me yeah. and my brother, which, oh my gosh, just wild. Yeah. Right. And so, like, I start, I sprint, actually, today's my sprinting day. Um, and I look like a maniac in my neighborhood, but I specifically do that to just get back to full tilt and get that exactly. Yeah. Like, don't lose that coordination. Well, and that, this is, I mean, this, again, I could go into this topic consistently, but on various different levels, right? I'm not going to sprint. I'm 40. I've had an air ductor, adductor tear. I've had a TFL tear. I've had some hip injuries through powerlifting, other things. So that's just not smart in my behalf. Uh, jumping, bounding, skipping, high elastic activity, stuff like that. Yes. Um, but I always, for me, and this is, I, I've asked this question to others, but I mean, I don't expect an answer. So I, you seen my swing catalyst vertical force production thing, right? So by rights, I should have like a 35 inch vertical. <laughs> being able to create that much vertical force. Right. Um, I think about 749 pounds, 360, whatever, 342% or something of body weight. But my vertical sucks. My vertical is absolutely awful. And it's really? self-admitted. It is God awful. But if you did all the parameter testing and without the swing catalyst, without the, the data, you would think like, oh, this guy's not going to be able to produce anything into the ground, right? So it's like, I think there's a factor of the, oh, I'm just losing the word, but it's more of how quick that energy can be produced more so than how much energy can be produced. Like there's a factor there of instantaneous pressure creation up the proper joint segment now mm -hmm. I'm getting a little deep, but you're understanding, obviously. But, you know, if you create pressure at the wrong spot, then that pressure is pointless anyways, right? Yeah. If you create pressure up the chain, like we'll say inside ball left foot up to, you know, uh, VMO up to hip joint, up to glute, rotation in the hip type of movement where it kind of flows up the chain, well, now that power as much as it could fully be produced, but at that certain instant is very being produced very quickly type of thing. Yeah. Right. It's like that reaction force or like reaction strength index. Even on that, I did those tests and I have terrible RSI as well, <laughs> but Which somehow in a golf swing with everything built up and the pressures built as high as I can get them, I can create a massive amount of vertical force. Right. And that's, that's just always a conundrum. Like this is the right. shit that I get into that. I'm like, how yeah. do I answer this question? <laughs> well, and, that, well, and that's, and that's interesting. So building on that, um, I, I, I heard an interview that you said, you know, you're, you're saying your vertical and your torque are elite, but mm -hmm. rotationally you lack. 
as a result, do you, do you just kind of accept and that's what it is? Or are you, are you trying to build rotation in? Have you tried to build that in? Or, am, or you're just kind of like, this is who I am. This is my <laughs> blueprint. And I, you're just supercharging that. Yeah, I think, you know, and the more people I talk to about ground force pressures and stuff like that, you know, it's it might not be in my best interest to just create more and more and more vertical. You know, it's almost, I heard a saying, you know, pressure throughout the swing is kind of like baking, right? A little too much of something might screw up the whole recipe or right. not enough, right? Not, it's not that everything has to be like through the roof. Um, you know, and absolutely honest, when I was doing that testing that day with Carson up at uh, the golf lab, my hardest balls hit weren't when I created the most amount of pressure. But when I tried to create the most amount of pressure, obviously it was a different feeling. And so the timing was slightly off and it, you know, I would dump the club a little, like we're talking milliseconds sooner, uh, but then it would cost a high, it would cause a high face strike because I was kind of under the ball instead of into the right. ball because I created more pressure. So everything happened faster. And the big reason I was actually trying to figure this out was with us being on um, like platforms uh, for competition because these platforms aren't like, you know, a, a metal swing catalyst where it's, you're not going to bend it. It's going to bend in flux with you, right. right? These stages made out of wood, well, that wood flexes. So. Right. And uh, that's uh, true, right? Like you're getting different reactions from your feet. Yeah. And so uh, I've always found that the highest, um, or let's just say the most repetitive guys when it comes to when we are on platforms are the higher rotational guys because they don't flex as much. And so the club doesn't move up and down in millimeters as, hmm. you know, as much we'll say. Um, it's more of, that was my biggest reason for trying to figure it out. The byproduct was, yeah, we saw I had a really, really high vertical. We pushed it a little, but it's more of, okay, so I, I don't have a massive amount of internal hip rotation in my right hip because of the adductor tear, because of a TFL tear in that hip. So am I going to go down the road of trying to create more internal rotation, knowing it's probably not capable it's, it's not, without yeah. scar tissue and everything right. like that? Or am I going to try and work in, on the timing of all those pressures to try and then make myself you know, the best hitter I can be, you know, within those parameters, whether that's getting a vertical higher and just learning my timing better or adding a little more rotation in or torque force. Um, you know, my horizontals pretty strong as it, as is, um, cause I'm a big, like, I'm a big lateral push guy. That's why I load up so hard on my right side because I can't turn. So I have to add the pressure, which is why I said earlier about keeping that right toe down because mm -hmm. I, no one on planet Earth has ever jumped as high as they could off their heels. Um, right. And that's actually funny. That, that's how I used to swing was very much like that. It's only been in the past year and a half that I've, I can, tur I've turned now. Right. And I actually have built that in. Right. So I, cause I had a lot of long drive elements in my swing. Like I push, I think my, my highest is like 308 vertical force. Right. Percentage which is, of my body which is high. Which well, yeah, really for, for for a normal for trying to play golf, I had a ton of that. Yeah. So um, I'm actually going in for a ground force assessment soon. So I'm curious to see where I'm at. But it's yes. very interesting. My swing is more from kind of where you were to a more rotational thing, and it's interesting. I didn't factor in what you're saying about the flexing of the environment because I have found that being more rotational was just better on grass. Yeah. And just for consistent strikes, and I'm seeing that finally now manifest in my game because I could hit it a mile, but my scoring wasn't working right. with that swing. Right. No, and that's, I mean, this is kind of where, you know, when I say I try not to leave any stone unturned, you know, who's thinking of flexing wood when you're standing on it during a competition, No, but that's right? so true. Like your platform. So so then, okay, so now flexing wood. So this is my, <laughs> this is my new obsession. Have you gone into footwear yet? <sighs> I know there's a factor. I, I, I I've, I've gone into I'm in, in the weeds on footwear, but I will almost say the harder the base you can stand on, the more pressure you're going to create. And I'm not a fan of squishy shoes in any way, shape, or form. No, nope. I just find there's pointless loss of energy. Um, and I mean, I <clears throat> I've hit 228 miles an hour 
wearing like Adidas street shoes just because the hard rubber sole, I can't get anything into it. So it's only thing to do is react out. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we're talking like carbon foot plates and stuff like that. And um, I seen you made a post with like painters. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I use their cricket shoes. Cricket shoes. Have, right. Cause they're a big um, cricket company in Europe. Yeah. Well, it, because of their, their, um, it doesn't flex. So like if you take like a foot joy premiere, right. you can bend a foot joy premiere, which is probably the firmest shoe in the, yep. on the golf market. Whereas if you take their cricket shoe with the, their specifically their bowler shoe, right. And these guys are coming in and hucking, right. you know, fastballs. Yeah. They're d- developing a ton of force. You can't really bend it. Right. And the other thing that I found too, with the platform and, and I like this on the course is that when you go to push and kind of keeping on the balls of your feet and pushing from the inside, yeah. I see a lot of amateurs at the driving range getting mad at themselves because they leak power by going to the outside of their foot. Yeah. Right. And they're wearing a, like they're wearing crappy trainers. And the first right. thing I'll tell them, I don't even give them a swing tip. I said, Hey man, go get yourself some real golf shoes because you're just leaking power. You're going outside of your body. Well, now you have to recenter and then, and they're, you're not athletically set up to do that. Right. So I've, I'm obsessed with the shoes now because I'm going, my connection to the ground is so vital. And, and I was finding I was slipping, like now that I've built in good vert plus the rotation, like I was looking like Bambi out there if I don't grip. Right. Oh and, yeah. Absolutely. And, and out in the Pacific Northwest, like it's soft. Oh right? yeah. I'm playing on the softest, you know, in Ontario, it's a little better. I yeah. could probably play almost in spikeless potentially in Ontario. Um, you know, especially in the middle of July. Right. Oh yeah. But, but I was just hating that slipping. So anyway, I was just curious if you, no, you touch shoes. It, it's true. Cause I went, um, I was playing with these, the echo H fours for ever. And it was more because I dragged my right foot like through, and I just kept ripping toe plates off constantly. Yeah. So these echoes, cricket, sh- cricket shoes have a, have a protector. I'm not, well, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not making a pitch, but I think you should try <laughs> I'll, I'll message Dave and see what he says. Um, but it's more of, that shoe was being worn for that purpose. Well, over the summer, uh, my good friend who runs one of the big events here in Canada, Jody, he's got a relationship with Duca del Cosmo. And they just came out with spiked shoes. And I'm like, I want to try spikes. Like, I haven't worn spikes in ages. Let's just see, like, now that my body's functionally movable. You're wearing no, you have not worn spikes for long drive. No. I was wearing really? spikeless forever, yeah. Just because... With the hip injury, and then I had a tear in my MCL in my left knee. I didn't want to Which be, I remember when we first played. Yeah, I had. didn't want to be overly True. stuck to the ground. Yeah, you know what? Fair, fair. It can, <laughs> and yeah. then I became more more mobile over time, and you know my athleticism became better. And then when I started picking up my left foot fully and then planting it, and I could rotate, you know, it was like, okay, well, the left knee never hurts. Like my left knee never sore now, even though I don't right. pick it up half the time these days. But um, that was kind of a learning pressure that just started following me into long drive. Um, but yeah, I found immediately when I went to the spike shoe, the first event I put them on, I was like, holy shit, I'm fast. Like, like significantly, like I'm faster than I was like three yeah. days ago. And it was almost a detriment because I got to the T box and now my timing's different because now my vertical sooner and it, it kind of threw me off. That was the one I went like OB OB. And then I'm like, shit, you got to like, just get a little more in control and right. win the next three. And so basically I went OB OB win, win second, get me through. And then the next day I had it all figured out and I walked through and end up losing by a yard to make top four or something in match play. Um, but it was like, it was just this like, holy shit, like this makes, yeah. such, this makes such a difference. And I don't think a lot of guys, you know, maybe they're not, if, if you're more rotational, it's not going to be as big, but I think a lot of guys would benefit from just a solid shoe. Like instead of these cushiony yeah. trainers, you know, then we get into like you see the guys getting outside their foot 
you know, in the backswing. And I mean, like a lot of, I see the toe come up and I'm like, oh, that's just suicide. Like stop trying to rotate so much. If it's not there, you're better off keeping that down and rotating less and then using that to go this way, <laughs> banking it and going. hundred percent. But it's, you know, I, I attribute it to a lot of stuff being taught out there too, like being shown on social media yeah. where they show like an Uber athlete in full extension in his right leg, full hip rotation and his foot is like the guy showing his foot's not on the ground, but nobody's watching the ground. Everyone's looking at his hip and his leg, yeah. right? It's not, okay, well, how do you go left from there? Like, you know, for a right-handed golfer, how do you go left? Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you gotta, you're just falling left at best. You're not driving left. Right. Um, and that's kind of where one of my big, like, coaching philosophies when it comes to, you know, teaching people, it's proper path. Yeah. Proper pressure equals proper power. And it's right. pretty simple acronym to remember. <laughs> no, but it's 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 so true, man. It's it's like, and I once I started, I didn't understand the value of ground forces. And now it's like it drives so much of my existence. Yeah. Well, you and know? You, so it, the crazy part is once you understand it, the effort you put in to get where you were is so much less. Right. Yeah. You know, because now you don't oh. have to, it's just your pressures are moving at the right time and in the right spaces. And now, you know, your swing at 110 feels like you're not even trying. So now to, if you want to push it to 115, 120, whatever, plus it's not difficult to do because the pressure is no. there. In the and I, and I found accuracy wise, I, I found that so much of my accuracy was in my feet. Yeah. You're right. You know, like I, like when I'm not synced up, I can, I can feel it's like if, when I'm not pushing off that and exactly what you're saying, keeping that toe down, staying on the ball of the foot on the, on the, the right foot so that it's not that stack tilt and like, and, and go down on it. And yeah, that's, that took me a while to learn. Oh yeah. To, to then do that. And then also then I, I needed to sh shed my verticals early because right. I was too late and I had a, like, if you look at my swing, when you and I played together, I would have had a bent left front knee. Yeah. And that's how I, that's how I played. Right. Yeah. And, and now, now I, I, I jump basically with almost, almost everything is just very scaled down when it yes. comes to the short irons. Yes. Um, but learning all that, the intricacy of that movement. And so that's oh, yeah. when I, that's, that's why I went down the rabbit hole on shoes because I started to realize like, how am I supposed to swell up all this power on the turn and keep that foot planted? Right. If it doesn't feel like it's glued. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, and then I've got, I've got the insoles in it too. That's cool. Okay. A yeah. couple more things before I, I know, cause I know you got to go. Okay. Uh, two more quick questions. Sure. One is, um, if you practice, you have to practice with a launch monitor cause there's just no oh, yeah, way. Absolutely. 100%. There's just, there's no chance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so, cause I think the TGL, made a mistake with their teams because there is literally no one else on this planet who spends more time with a launch monitor than you guys. <laughs> and I think if they're good, like now that they've got, I'm officially want a petition that each team needs a long drive guy because oh, that would just make would so it. much sense. We would love it. That, like, it. Like put one of you mutants on each team. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, for the paycheck. Yeah, I'm down hundred percent. No questions asked, but even for the entertainment value. And it, well, and that's, that's the part where, you know, I've always said, I'm like, we're entertainers first, like we're competitors. But when, when I go out there for charity outings or corporate events and stuff like that, it's an entertainment piece. They, people can't see the ball after we hit it for more than like a hundred yards. They have no clue, right? Like it's, it's too, it's too fast. It's gone too quickly. If there's not someone out there with a camera sending back video, they have no idea. They just hear the sound, see the ball take off and they think it's ballistically hilarious. Like, yeah. they're like, what? Oh. Because it, like, we've like, you know, I'm decently long and like, I've played with guys who are decently long. When you guys hit it, it is so different planet yeah. than what you <laughs> see on a golf course. And I'm, and I'm kind of like, if you want the fact, if you want the entertainment factor of like, you're playing on Monday night on TV and, and especially since it's like a team format, so there's alternate shot, all these things like it, you guys have to be out there. Like it, and nobody knows how to optimize a launch monitor better than you guys. Well, and that's the crazy part. We're, you know, I'm, I'm all for like this indoor golf competition. Obviously, like I play on the next tour. I have no business playing on the next tour, but I just do it for maybe I'll win the long drive hole. If not, 
I get to talk to guys. I get to shoot shoot the business guys, interact with people, right? And my last round, I shot like 81 or something. It was awful. But I, I literally YOLO'd every hole. Like I, yeah. I could have probably hit iron off. The, I literally driver, 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 driver. And I actually hit like eight or nine fairways doing this on that tight golf course. Wedge game was awful. But there was one hole that I... I backed off like very backed off to keep it short of this water because i was like well we said we're hitting driver but if you go and watch that hole i can't remember if it was like 14 or 13 or something like that but i hit 179 ball speed and it didn't even look like i was like trying like i don't i don't don't want to sound arrogant like you look like you were putting it probably it it looked looked like i slapped (laughs) it out there and it hit and ran and we were at elevation i think it went to like 330 or something stayed short of the water so that was the goal um but then on like the last couple holes i yoloed it to like 204 205 and you know it was like you could visually see the effort difference in the two and i'm like well yeah that's 25 miles an hour faster than way above the PJ tour average, right? Like 179 yeah. to 205, they're obviously two different mechanical movements um, of the swing. But that's where, you know, when you see Bryson, when Bryson's in like full full gear on the live tour, he's 195, maybe up to like 198. But this this new generation coming, this new athlete coming up and from the NCAA to, you know, the Canadian tour or whatever they call it now, McKenzie tour um, to the corn Ferry tour. You know, I, I tell my juniors, the NCAA is faster than the corn Ferry. The corn Ferry is faster than the PGA and the PGA is just going to keep getting faster because that's, who's coming into it. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, when we look at the TGL and stuff like that, I'm like, Guys, this is built for us. Like this, hundred percent. This is literally like our wheelhouse. I this, think the one problem we would have um, is the potential misreading of things. That's the only you guys just problem. you're too hot. Yeah, it, literally, it's too fast. Yeah, and I mean, I'm working. I'm working with TrackMan to you know we're trying to figure out everything. Um, and that the part I love about TrackMan is they're willing. Like they're they don't. You know, when I have questions, they're answering, they're talking, they're chatting. Well, we'll try this firmware. We'll try that firmware. Like it's it's a never ending pursuit of perfection with TrackMan, which is something I think is just awesome for a company like that who already, yeah. to me, has kind of the gold standard in the industry when it comes to specific things. That's awesome. Well, this is my official petition that you guys should be in the TGL. <laughs> just figure out some contingencies so that the, the, there's no misreads. Yeah, but, uh, sure. It's like TGL plus. I mean, I think they were using full swing, so I'm like, yeah. I don't think that yeah. would hold us. Um, no, not no. yet. I mean, I'm sure not they're going to put money into it anyway, but yeah, I mean, awesome. I'm down. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, dude, thank you so much for your time, um, guys. Follow Ryan on on Instagram. I've linked him in the description of this podcast. Um, he's also available as a coach. So if you want to get your speed up, if you want to get, you know. Look at all the things he's dissected in his game and the amount of detail. <laughs> Taking all that information and putting it into your own game can be nothing short of beneficial. So hit him up on Skillist uh, on that app. Um, I'll also link that in the description for this. And brother, thank you so much for your time. So glad we we're able to reconnect. This was yeah, unreal. I, could, I, I love how deep into the weeds you get. This has been <laughs> phenomenal. Um, I know you have to go, but I appreciate all your time. And thank you so much. And uh, guys, I will catch you on the next one. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. Thanks, brother.